Well, thank you for coming. Um, Colour rendering properties of window glass. Um, as far as I've been able to discover, nobody's ever given a paper before about um, the problem of colour rendering for window glass in general. Um, it's been a non-subject. Papers appear all the time about the colour rendering of LED lamps, but nothing about windows, so maybe it's time we started to think about the visual effects of filtering daylight, especially today, while the whole of the CID, CIE colour rendering system is under review um, and open to debate. So um, why does colour rendering matter for window glass? Well, first, to compare the performance of alternative glasses in sensitive applications, it's pretty obvious that not every window glass um, is, equally, is equally suitable. And um, we have no way of telling, really, which is good and which is bad for applications like art galleries, uh, museums, and so forth. But it's also important because it helps us to clarify the choice of electric lamps in daily interiors. Um, in this part of the room, obviously, most of the light comes from daylight, and here most of the light comes from electric light. So the colour rendering of the light is determined here by daylight, here mainly by electric light. And the important thing to realise, and I think seldom pointed out, is that the colour rendering properties of the lighting then vary from point to point in a room like that. Um, maybe that doesn't matter, but as soon as you put tinted glass in the window, then it raises all sorts of questions. Um, all sorts of questions for the electric lighting too. Should the electric lighting be trying to match the colour rendering properties of the tinted glass um, or not? And questions like if the daylight through the tinted glass has poor colour rendering properties, is there any sense in using electric, light, electric lamps which have um, a colour rendering index of greater than 90? Questions like that we can't even address unless we have some way of, of quantifying the colour rendering properties of the glass. Uh, well, before I go any further, um, I want, think I ought to ask how many of you are familiar with that diagram? Uh, fortunately, fortunately, it's dark, so I can't see, but <laughs> <laughs> I think about a third of you. And hands up those who have never seen it before. Oh, only a few of you. Well, probably about the same proportion, I think. OK, uh, well, that tells me where to pitch things. Um, I recall that 15 years ago when the first edition of Peter Boyce's book um, Human Factors in Lighting was published, um, I, I wrote a review of it and said it was a mistake to try to deal with colour rendering and colour vision in 21 pages um, and it would be better not to try. Well, now I'm going to do it in five minutes, and it would be better not to try. Those of you who know all about it will either have to forgive me or interrupt. But the basis of colour imagery is this, what we were taught at school, that any colour can be matched by a suitable additive mixture of three independent primaries. So that we can, once we've defined the primaries, we can define any other colour in terms of how much of each of the three primaries that needed to match it. What we weren't told at school, what I wasn't told at school, uh, was that you can use any three colours as primaries. It isn't just um, um, those colours, but any colours uh, can still be used. So to, to undertake colorimetry systematically, you actually have to agree internationally on three primaries. And the CIE, the Commission Internationale de l'Eclairage, um, did that in 1931. 
and everybody's been baffled ever since. Um, so they called their primaries X, Y, and Z, or if you're American, you X, Y, and Z. And um, the, the idea is that um, any color can be specified in terms of X, Y, and Z. Um, you, you just have to give the X coordinates, the Y coordinates, and the Z coordinates. And notice this is capital X, Y, and Z. And it's more convenient, obviously, to be able to express it on a flat sheet of paper, which they did by defining little x and little y. Um, those are the equations. And of course, you could have little z, which equals 1 minus little x plus little y. Um, and th that fits on the flat sheet of paper, but it doesn't contain it now any information about the luminance, only what they called the chromaticity. So here is x along the x-axis, y along the y-axis. Um, you see the various wavelengths around the outside of the chart going from 760 to 400 nanometers. And you'll notice one characteristic of the CIE chromaticity chart is that there, there's a lot of space given to the green and very little space given to the purple, violet, um, deep red. And this was chosen for its mathematical properties. And one of the properties, of course, uh, which is convenient, is that if you have two light sources with chromaticities A and B, all the colours that can be obtained by combining, additively combining A and B are in a straight line from A to B. The idea of a black body plays a large part, played a large part. This was all standardized in 1931. And in those days, all the practical light sources were either incandescent lamps or oil lamps or candles or gas mantles. Uh, so they all had a colour um, which could be, um, which, which was identical, in fact, with what they called the black body. A black body is um, just an object which um, absorbs all the light that falls upon it. And physicists can calculate for a given temperature exactly what the spectral distribution of a black, black body is. So you can define on the CIE chromaticity chart the position of a black body at 2000 K, 3000 K, 5000 K, and so forth up to infinity. So a filament lamp has a color temperature, to use the term they use, of 2850 K. A halogen lamp, about 3000 K. A cool white fluorescent lamp, of course, is nothing like a black body. Um, but it still has something like the same colour, and so it's given a colour temperature of 4,200 or 4,300. And the daylight, when it came to measure the chromaticity of daylight, there was obviously quite a lot of scatter, but mostly, well, invariably, it was close to this line, which is actually a little on the green side of the black body locus. But it was possible to define the colour of daylight, not on the same locus, but still to define it in terms of colour temperature, as we can see here. Now, colour rendering. <laughs> There's the definition. A colour rendering index indicates the fidelity with which a light source reproduces the colours of illuminated objects. There's something hidden in that definition which isn't always pointed out. Um, because what is the true appearance of an illuminated object, an apple or an orange or something like that? And the answer, of course, is that it depends on the light source. 
So if you're assessing the color rendering um, with respect to, um, um, uh, well, it has to be with respect to some light source. Um, now, the way the CIA got out over that is that they, they had to define for each lamp an ideal target reference source. And they did it this way. They said the reference source for a given lamp is the black body which has the same colour temperature. Or if it has a large, a high colour temperature, over 5000 K, then it's defined as the, the, the reference lamp is defined as the phase of daylight on the daylight locus, which again has the same correlated colour temperature. The next thing you need in, in order to um, have a colour rendering system is a limited number of test colour samples. And the CIE defined 12, of which the most commonly used are these eight. And you can see they all have the same, um, the, the same reflectance, broadly the same reflectance, depends of course on the light source. And all have the same chroma, to use the Munsell term, but they all differ in hue. And then the next thing you need is a uniform chromaticity scale. Um, because remember, the disadvantage of the CIE chromaticity chart is that there's a lot of light, a lot of space given to the greens and not enough given to the blues and reds. So they devised a new chromaticity chart called the UV chart. Um, here it is, um, which they believed had uh, uniform chromaticity uh, properties. And then the way to assess the colour rendering of a lamp is to uh, um, identify the target, um, calculate on the chromaticity chart the chromaticity of each of these eight test colours, plot them on this UV chart, measure the difference. Here they are, here, here, here are two lamps, two, sorry, light sources, um, with the chromaticity, I'm sorry, with the chromaticity points of the eight test colours. This is red, orange, yellow, green, green again, blue, violet, purple. Um, this is for what is taken as average daylight. D65 is daylight, the point on the daylight locus, which has a colour temperature of 6,500 K. And this is a typical gas field incandescent lamp. And you can see they have different shapes. Well, this would be the target then, or um, close to the target for a warm white fluorescent lamp. This would be close to the target for an artificial daylight lamp. And as I said, for, for, to estimate the colour rendering, you go through these steps. Um, um, plot the octagon, eight, eight points, um, because there are eight, eight test samples. Um, under the lamp under test, under the target reference source, having the same colour temperature, um, measure the difference between each of these points, for each of those points, between the target, uh, the target and the actual source, and then uh, do a little calculation which is fiddled to make sure that if there's no difference, the colour render index is, zero, is 100. You'll sometimes hear it said that the lowest colour render index is zero, but that's quite untrue for a low pressure sodium. I think it's minus 42. Well, the point at which I came into this um, um, subject was um, 
in connection with the lighting of hospitals. You may remember in the, in the 1970s, those of you who are old enough will remember that in the 1970s uh, there was a lot of agitation about fluorescent lamps in hospitals. Um, that there was a, an unfortunate incident where um, a patient um, was taken from the operating theatre into the lift and from the lift into the corridor and the, there was a different lamp, light source in the lift from what there was in the corridor and the anaesthetist um, thought the patient was about to expire and there was panic and it was realised that there needed to be um, standardisation of um, electric fluorescent lamps in hospitals and nobody thought about um, what about using tinted glass in hospitals, wouldn't that throw up the same problems? Um, so I um, um, started to look at this and I started by looking at what was then called the um, anti-sun green glass and Um, here's the actual glass that, that um, was you. Oh, sorry, I should have. There's the actual glass that's used. And just looking at that, you can see that it's, um, it's you see that it looks green. Um, and it obviously looks green because Because you can see it's spectral transmission, it's deficient in red light, it absorbs a lot of red light, um, which is useful of course for reducing solar gain, but um, it obviously changes both the apparent colour of the light, of the, of the glass, and also um, the colour of the light which it transmits. And it occurred to me that if you reduce um, in effect, reduce the sensitivity of um, an observer to red light. Um, that's the same thing as making, the same sort of thing as making him red blind. Um, not necessarily, going, obviously not going the whole way, but to, to some extent. So there is this recognised form of colour blindness called protonopia. It isn't the commonest sort, but it's the sort that's due um, we now know, to the long wave sensitivity, the long wave cones um, being either, either not working or being missing entirely. So there are the three types of cones, long wave, medium wave, short wave, and reducing the effect of, the lo reducing the sensitivity to the long wave gives you what's called protonomaly, and if it's missing entirely, you get um, protonopia. And those are recognised forms of colour blindness, so it seemed the obvious thing to do was to um, set up a colour cabinet, set up a, an artificial daylight lamp, and let it shine through um, a number of glasses, but let's concentrate on that green one, and see um, whether there's evidence of protonopia or protonomaly. Well, the <coughs> um, simplest quantitative test for protonopia, in fact for all sorts of um, colour blindness, is the farnsworth mansell 100 hue test. Some of you will be familiar with it. Um, so you have little tubs um, with samples of different colours different colours going right round the spectrum. Um, again, all the same reflectance. You can see a box of them here. And there are a hundred of them. So you can see you can see on that sort of slide the difference of colours which <coughs> goes right round the hue circle. But when you're actually confronted with them and, and try to set them in order, because that's what you're asked to do, um, it's very difficult. The ones next to each other are very nearly identical. 
And so here is the um, 100 hue test. You can see around the circle the samples. And when you come to score the errors which people make, that's diagnostic. Um, P, the red, locuses, loci, lo <coughs> um, are typical of protonopia. These are typical of deuteranopia. These are typical of tritonopia. I won't go through all the types of color blindness, but it was clear that we were looking for this sort of effect. And we didn't find it. Well, that's good news for the National Health Service, um, but bad news for Joe Lines because it's bad for one's reputation. Um, how, do you, how do you explain this? Why shouldn't there have been any sign of protonomaly? Well, well, the obvious thing to do is to calculate the colour rendering index of, of um, the daylight seen through these lamps, um, which I proceeded to do. But you don't get far before you see that it's impossible, because uh, what is the reference source for a to compare with a sheet of green glass? It's, it's not obvious. Um, you could compare it, of course, with daylight, D65. A lot of people do do that. But it's not really a fair way of comparing different glasses because um, uh, according to the colour rendering index, strictly defined, that you, every glass would have a, every class, glass of a different tint would have a different target. And of course, what one wants to know is how green glass, grey glass, um, bronze glass, gold glass, silver glass, how each of these compares with each other, and you can't do it with the colour rendering index system. What you need is, as it says there, Aladdin's wonderful lamp, and that doesn't exist. So you can't, there isn't an ideal reference source for um, daylight, but what you could do, given that program, was to plot the octagons, the space occupied by the eight colour samples. So here it is for average daylight, D65. Here it is for D65 transmitted through that green glass. There's no difference, is there? So little difference that you have actually to search for it. Um, there is a difference. If you see that cross in the middle, um, represents the chromaticity of the light source, and that's moved off towards the left. Remember, it's the UV, not the CIE. Um, chromaticity diagram uh, and well of course we know green glass looks green and that's all it's telling us um, but you see this explains rather neatly why there was no difference in color discrimination when we moved from average daylight d65 to the green uh, body tinted glass they were the same nearest dummy you can hardly tell the difference well, that solved that problem. So obviously the next thing is to, to have a look at other, um, other sheets of glass. There's a bronze glass. And a, and a grey glass, which in those days was, were the principal glasses which were used. And I'm going to show you the octagons for those as well. Here's, oh, sorry. Oh dear, what have I done? 
1965 again, the grey glass giving you that spectral transmission and that octagon and the bronze glass and these two are very similar aren't they and this is not all that dissimilar and it occurred to me that that the area of the octagon for a given glass lit by D65 um, must be proportional to the number of distinct surface colours that can be distinguished under that light source. Well, this is worth knowing if you're concerned with medical diagnosis. It's worth then knowing for a whole lot of other purposes. And then, of course, immediately one spots all... Oh, before we go on, yes. The, the, this is the octagon area for various forms of glass. Um, and so D65, average daylight, is 0.048. And these come pretty close. Um, and this is not all that far away. But to get some impression of the significance of that, have a look at the um, electric lamps which were in use at the same time, also in hospitals, and you can see that compared with the D65, incandescent is only 0.026, warm white lamps 2.22, white 0.24, and so forth, whereas today's cool triphosphor lamps 0.048 matches D65. Well, these lamps were being used in hospitals and all over the place, in offices and so forth. So this tells us that we needn't worry too much about those particular glasses. But here's some further properties of what became known as the gamut area. Um, first of all, a light source with a large gamut area makes colour surfaces look more vivid. This diagram is an exaggeration, but it shows the sort of thing that I mean. And then, within reasonable limits, people like to see surface colours strengthened. So large ga gamut, gamut areas are preferred to small gamut areas. Most people oopsie, are happier with... Ah, sorry. Ah, oh, forget it. <laughs> um, and then there's the Helmholtz-Kohlrausch effect, which you will find in the textbooks which says that saturated colours of a given reflectance or a given luminance look brighter than neutral colours of the same luminance. Um, I wouldn't trust this diagram. I wouldn't trust this diagram because it depends on a whole lot of colour reproduction, a whole sequence of colour reproduction steps. Um, but I would trust this diagram, which is pretty much internationally accepted, which shows different parts of the CIE diagram for a given luminance. Um, it, it's clear that these are the shapes of these lines are uh, consistent, so that for a given luminance you get much, much higher apparent brightness in the extreme blue-violet end of the spectrum and in the extreme red end than you do with the whites or yellows. And a consequence of that, oh, here's another illustration which you're probably more familiar with. These are two separate pages um, of the Munsell Atlas, and they've been displaced vertically, so don't read straight across. But um, as those of you who are familiar with the Munsell system will know, um, all the lamps on a horizontal line um, have the same reflectance. Um, but to most people, the ones with the highest chroma will seem brighter than the ones which are neutral. Here for blue, the same is true. So to sum up um, the significance of the gamut area, it gives you better discrimination of surface colours. Surface colours look more vivid, more saturated. 
the environment looks brighter, what we used to call visual clarity, and people actually prefer larger ga gamut areas up to a point. Um, something which is, if, if you make the um, surfaces look very garish, then people start to object. Well, the CIE colour rendering index was, was um, defined in 1964, and since then there have been a number of objections. Um, what one objection is that the UV chart um, really isn't a, universe, a uniform chromaticity chart at all. We thought it was in 1964, but recent research has shown that it isn't. Um, the test colours, the, the HS test colours, the 12 that were defined and the 8 which are usually used, have a what I call roller coaster reflectance shapes. And this means that they're very likely, or more likely than most colours, to um, show a hue shift when different light sources illuminate them. And it isn't an accident that they have two peaks. Um, remember, the Munsell system is, is the Munsell atlas is constructed by mixing pigments. And if you mix two pigments and the two pigments have different peaks, then what comes out is likely to have two peaks. And then the scoring system for, for the CI system can be misleading um, because a decrease in saturation or a decrease, as we now, would now say, um, in the um, gamut, gamut area, um, scores the same as an increase in um, gamut area, although everybody can see the difference between them, and indeed everybody knows that the increase in ga gamut area is likely to be preferred, um, but the two lamps, then having the same colour rendering index, may be quite different, and may also, although they have the same colour rendering index, um, may give less satisfactory colour rendering. Oops. So right now in 2015, there are proposals being put forward um, to change the CA colour rendering index. Um, first, um, there's no agreement yet about a uniform chromaticity chart, but there is unan unan unanimous belief that the UV system has to be replaced. Um, the test colours, there's a general feeling that eight test colours are not enough. People have been fiddling, especially with LED lamps, um, to get a good score um, uh, by, by picking, picking and choosing the um, test colours. So here's, a, here's one suggestion that's been put forward of a number of test colours with reflectances which aren't re-entrant, which don't have the roller coaster. And then the reference targets, the ones which are so difficult for us um, in the um, daylight group, um, they're, rather, they're intending to keep the reference targets um, just simply to smooth out the transition which takes place at 5000 K between the black body and the um, daylight lo lo locus. Oops. Now the um, objection to the reference source for window glass is this. Um, first, if you want to compare them all to D65, this would penalise blue glass, bronze glass, green glass, and so forth unfairly. On the other hand, if you have a different, a different target for every glass, then it means you can't compare one sort of glass for another, with another. So I've been asking myself, can we dispense with a reference source for window glass? Oh, before I go any further, I ought to mention this document. Um, 
it, this is an internationally agreed standard. It says it's a British standard, um, but in fact it's been more influenced in America than in England. Um, has anybody seen this document? One person. Is that Paul? All oh, right. <laughs> You've seen it. I was looking at it earlier this morning. Oh, good. How did you get hold of it? Oh, I see. All right. Well, one person then has seen it, and uh, two people. I'm sorry, have seen it. Three people have seen it. I'm sorry. Uh, well, it's. I think it's fair to say it's not a bestseller. Um, and and this sets out D65 as the target for all um, all window glass, which is a pity. So how ought we to proceed? Well, <coughs> going back to first principles, um, surface colours have, as Munsell would put it, um, hue, value and chroma. I'm sure you're familiar with this. So hue would be the subjectively dominant part of the spectrum. A value is what we would call reflectance, going from black to white. And chroma is the vividness of the colour going from neutral right up to, to a spectrally pure colour. Um, it, it seems to me that... Well, yeah. Um, the the um, colour rendering properties of a light source or, or rather a light source, any light source, a window glass or anything else, um, will, will in general affect the hue and the value and the chroma. So it's sensible to analyse, if we're thinking about colour rendering, the effect of a, a window on hue, value and chroma. So starting off with value, let's take a reflectance like this. That is a very narrow spectral band, then what is the effect of uh, any light source, different, different glasses then, on that? It won't affect its chromaticity, it won't affect its spectral distribution, it won't affect its colour, but it can affect the reflectance. If the light source is deficient at that wavelength, then the reflectance will go down. If it has a lot of light at that wavelength, then the reflectance will go up. So if we're just concerned with preserving the lightness rendering potential of a window glass, we want narrow bands like that. These would be um, perhaps suitable. And you can easily quantify that the light, lightness rendering potential of window glass could be expressed as the ratio of the minimum reflectance to the maximum reflectance of the window glass, call it the transmittance ratio, which in this case would be 0.6. So we've solved the problem of conserving lightness. What about hue and chroma? Well, the criterion for chroma rendering has to be the gamut area. But there's a snag. Window glass is not a light source and gamut area is a property of a light source. The gamut area for a window glass depends on the spectrum of the daylight source. And we can calculate the gamut area for the glass alone if we assume a perfectly neutral source. Um, I'm sorry, I've managed to... managed to put an old, old slide here. I had actually corrected it. Um, this should be at unity. It's actually at point 0.9 on that diagram. Imagine it's at unity, I'm sorry. It has been changed, but didn't manage to get onto this stick. 
And if you imagine that, and then multiply it by the class transmittance, you get that curve, which is actually identical with that curve, because all we've done is multiply that curve by 1. And then we can calculate the gamut area of this, which is a light source, but actually all we need to do is calculate the gamut area of that, which isn't a light source, it's a transmittance. Um, now, I'm being a bit naughty here, because we, we have assumed a light source. There's no mistaking that. Um, I feel we can do it for two reasons. First of all, I'm not using it as an ideal target. Um, it's the same target for every, um, for every glass. Uh, and secondly, um, And, and secondly, um, it's perfectly possible for a glass to exceed the gamut area that would, would that the gamut area, oopsie, that a perfectly neutral glass could have. For example, anybody who's used neodymium glass will know that you get a bigger gamut area with neodymium glass than you would with perfectly clear glass. However, it's a philosophical question whether we're allowed to invoke a, a light source when its only effect is to multiply that by unity to get that. And then we, there's the question of how do we calculate the effect of window glass on the hue? Well, there are three possible causes of hue, hue shift. One is a roller coaster transmittance curve, something like that. The next is a roller coaster, roller coaster test colour, which is something like that. It doesn't have to be the test colour. I mean, it can be a bath bun or a cup of tea or any of the things which people complain about. And, of course, the worst, worst situation is an interaction between this and this, because obviously if those two peaks coincide, then it goes in, up in the sky, and if these troughs go, coincide, they come right down here. On the other hand, if they're out of phase, you've got a completely different effect, and um, it's this that one has to be care. Well, one, well, it's this anyhow, one has to find a way of quantifying. And we do have um, roller coaster reflective curves. We've got here butter and lettuce, which actually matter. And we've also got the human skin. Um, these are typical um, spectral reflectance curves for, um, I wouldn't even say typical, they're representative um, um, spectral reflectance curves for human skin. Um, the red one for it's labelled Europe. The one below it is labelled East Asia, which really means Japan and China. South Asia, which means India, and Africa, which means Africa. Um, and, and just looking at that, one thing is obvious: the roller coaster one, the critical one, is is this one. That, that a light source or a, a window which is perfectly acceptable in Africa or India would be, might well be unacceptable because it distorts people's faces in um, Europe. And, and it's interesting, if you look through the literature of colour rendering and especially with regard to the human face, um, all the papers come from, mostly, pra practically all come from Europe, a few come from North America, Hardly any come from India or Japan or any of those places. 
and this helps to explain it. So we have to think about these as the uh, critical, um, critical samples. And just to remind you, that, oh, sorry. And just to remind you then of a property of the CIE chart, the straight line property. Um, every point on that line represents a colour which can be obtained by mixing A or B. But that line also means you, you, you could add to B, for example, light right from the spectrum out here, or you could add a colour, an intermediate colour there and perhaps there to get the same colour here. So there's an ambiguity, you, you can't simply define, you can't exclusively define this colour in terms of this and that because all sorts of other complications, well, co combinations could, uh, even along that line, could have produced that. Now, the straight line here, oops, sorry. A straight line here, more or less straight, the textbooks say that. Now, these are the textbooks, the limits, you're reading the textbooks from 525 to 760. You, you could have more accurately called it 540 to 760, but here is a straight line. And it's interesting that Most of the critical um, surfaces lie close to that straight line. And the, what's critical is that a colour, say here, oh yes, part of chromaticity there, could be due to a mixture of that and that, but could equally be a mixture of a whole lot of wavelengths <coughs> up there and a whole lot of wavelengths down there. And that's the ambiguity, and that's why. If you combine that with the roller coaster, um, a roller coaster transmission curve for window glass, you are in trouble for hue, hue, for, for, um, hue preservation. Right, now let's look at things which people complain about. And we've got lots of experience from fluorescent lighting. All the people who complain about the colour of fluorescent lighting are complaining about these one or other or a combination of those. And they're all in that part of the chromaticity diagram. And many of them have roller coaster reflectances. So the nightmare scenario can occur when both the glass and the surface have a roller coaster between 525 and 760 nanometers. And here's an example. I'm sorry. An example of a window glass which is asking for trouble. And I'm suggesting that we define a hue conservation index in this way. Um, um, the peak minus the trough of reflectance divided by A plus B. Oh, sorry, one minus of that lot. So that if there's a perfect glass would have one and an imperfect glass would have a great deal less than one. And notice that no target light source is assumed for conserving hue. No tar target light source was assumed allowing for reflectance and only a light source having a uniform neutral um, distribution is assumed and doesn't have to be assumed for assessing um, the gamut area. And so this summarises the three 
suggested criteria for hue, value, chroma. And these are the values for some of the glasses that we were looking at. Um, this would be for a perfectly clear glass. I've expressed the gamut areas as a percentage of that. And then green antison, grey antison, and bronze. And the advantage of doing it in, in that way is that you can take oops, sorry. Is that you can take any application, um, uh, for example, a hospital, and um, obviously hue, value, and chroma are all important. So you'd aim for a high score on your glass for each of those. Um, for a restaurant, hue would be important. You've got to see whether vegetables especially are fresh, and chroma also. For an art gallery, is it rather surprising? I've just said the only thing that matters is the reflectance. And the reason why I've said that is that the uh, high score of reflectance, remember how it was defined, minimum divided by maximum, um, so a high score would mean a perfectly um, neutral glass. So it's sufficient, if it's very, very critical, um, to define simply the reflectance, um, or rather the effect on the reflectance, um, which is minimum of maximum transmittance. So looking back at these figures, um, you can see that the um, highest gamut was for, uh, it, for those glasses that we looked at um, was um, um, for the grey glass. Um, the highest hue conservation was from the bronze glass and um, the green glass comes intermediate between those glasses. What's special about the 525 to 6, 760 um, wavelength band? Well, if we look at the cones, the sh short, medium and long wave cones, you can see that 525 or below 525, I prefer the figure 540, um, there's no contribution from the short wavelength bands at all. And you can see that that medium wavelength band and this long wave band are really quite similar so that a small change in, um, in um, um, the spectrum in this sort of area would have a large effect. So it's this area that is critical from 525 to 760 nanometers. Well, that's all about colour rendering, but I, I, I just want to add a few things about the effect of the internal wall surfaces and how they would interact with um, tinted glass. I won't insult you by asking if you don't know what a daylight factor is, uh, and you'll be familiar with this expression of Paul Littlefair's, which assumes that that reflectance is neutral. Now, if it isn't neutral, if um, each wavelength has a different reflectance, then the average daylight factor will be different for different wavelengths. So wavelength lambda, it will be proportion, will be equal to T lambda, W the area of glass, theta the angles intended, and so forth, and R um, lambda, the average reflectance at that wavelength. Um, and if you look at that expression, 
then, and you are thinking just of the reflectance of walls, ceiling and floor, um, the average daylight factor at a wavelength lambda is proportional to 1 over 1 minus r lambda squared, 1 over that lot. So here are two um, spectral reflectance curves. This one is perfectly neutral, and this one, just for comparison, would give you the same average reflectance, but 1 over 1 minus r lambda squared would give you a quite different curve from A. And what counts here, I mean, this is, look, it's four times what the average would be. So the effect is that coloured walls will always increase the average daylight factor. The same applies to artificial lighting as well, and that's seldom recognised. So we can say that the daylight factor is strongly influenced by the wavelength with the highest reflectance. And we can also say, say that interreflections increase the perceive, perceived saturation or chroma of pale colours. So, I mean, isn't this one's experience? You go home and you get, by, by an off-white paint, sort of slightly pink perhaps, and then when all the walls are painted, it looks a very sa rel relatively saturated pink. Well, that's, that's all we're saying here. Um, but it does actually, it is reflected in the daylight factor itself. Um, now, how does that interact with the spectral transmission, transmittance. And if you examine the, that equation, the daylight factor will be independent of the wavelength if that divided by that is a constant. Or, rearranging the terms, if the reflectance at a given wavelength is equal to 1 minus the transmittance of that wavelength divided by k, the constant. And k can have almost any value. So let's see what happens um, if we have this transmittance, which is the green glass that we started off with, and we put k equals 1 then if the room reflectance, the average room reflectance, has that shape, then it means that the daylight factor will be the same um, at every wavelength. Or in other words, the daylight factor will be independent of the wavelength. And this applies whatever the colour of the, of the um, daylight spectrum outside the building. But you can put different values of k in. And this one I've put k equals 2. And this one I've put k equals 0.85. If I put anything much lower than that, then you'd have had a negative um, reflectance at some wavelength. So, but this gives you some idea of the range. Now, you, you, this one's hardly practicable because it means everything in the room would have to be painted very nearly white. Um, but it does show that, quite a, that if you've got high reflectances, um, quite a small change in reflectance at a given wavelength can have quite a large effect. So this small change offsets that change in transmittance. But this curve, remember it's the average, so you can have different colours on different surfaces to get that sort of average, and that can be done. <coughs> 
so we can specify separately the effect of selective window glass on hue, value and chroma and we can also predict the effect of selective transmittance, oh, sorry, the effect on the combined effect of selective transmittance with selective surface reflectances. Well, today the CIA colour rendering system is under revision and the question I'd like to leave with you is, should the daylight group be bringing forward some proposal or are we satisfied with the British standard which three of us have seen, um, but which I, I, I ought to say, um, um, when I asked, which was about a month ago, nobody at BRS had seen it, um, nobody in SIBSI had seen it, nobody in the daylight group had seen it, um, and um, um, so, so it's obviously a stitch up between the glass manufacturers and the colour rendering um, um, community. Well, thanks for listening. <laughs>